Excellent. So um, <clears throat> to recap, uh, last week we talked a little bit about uh, what finance and decentralized finance is, and we dived a little bit into uh, stable currencies, and we sort of finished with the um, with a simple um, re um, recall on non cryptocurrency stable coins that have been used in in real life and all of which failed um in in a sense that the pack couldn't hold right uh does it mean that the stable coins or stable assets are useless no it doesn't mean that it means that it's very hard for an extended period of time to have something stable in financial markets uh, so financial markets have cyclic uh, dependencies uh, different countries fluctuate slightly differently and different assets fluctuate differently so having kind of something that is packed is always artificial and it will work for a certain period of time but it will never work forever so there is always kind of a limit of what you know how far some something can be stabilized so we don't have uh, time to um we don't have time to dive into the details of how it actually works uh with the uh maker dao and dai setup uh, it is possible that uh, we may have a lecture on that later, uh, but I just want to uh, highlight the, uh, the main concept. So the first concept is the market, uh, which means we have a stable asset living in some sort of financial context, right? So if the stable asset lives in the context of the Norwegian krona, for example, um, the krona itself fluctuates and all the other assets fluctuate as well. So the stable pegged asset is kind of, um, you always need to take the market into account, like what are the forces and what is kind of a stable in relation to what else, right? So we may have some collateral. If the collateral is in Norwegian Krona, and then we have kind of like a, uh, like an electronic version, like stable coin, uh, then, we try to pack this, but then the collateral is a nook, which means that is kind of by de definition stable, right? If the collateral is an ether, uh, then the this is kind of a uh, so we're trying to stabilize this in, in the context of nook, but ether kind of fluctuates in the context of nook as well, right? So we, we need to take the market into account. So then we have the DAI. So DAI, so let's let's rewrite it into, into the terms that are there. So we have uh, USDC, for example, uh, which is the, the, the stable asset. We have a USD a collateral, potentially, or ether collateral. And then the DAI is the um, is that is that coin, right? So DAI is the stable asset that we kind of generated, which is pegged to US dollar. And then we have REP token. So what is a REP token? Um, REP token is uh, a token that is used to manage the exchange and the uh, closure of the collateral if the collateral reaches the risk level for the stable asset, right? So for example, if we have released um, uh, I don't know, uh, 100 of a stable asset, which is an equivalent of 100 US dollars, uh, and then there is a higher demand and the price goes up, then you can use the REP token to issue, um, to lock more collateral to issue more, more DAI, right? So REP is like, a, uh, you can say a government's token, uh, which is used for operating on the smart contracts. So, so here you have this sort of the DAO uh, that manages the system. And then it kind of locks the ether and issues the DAI. And then if you have the, the collateral pools, some of them, like, let's say we have some, uh, uh, not ether, but I don't know, Dogecoin, okay? So we have uh, some collateral that lost value and then it has to be closed 
then you can use rep tokens to vote what should happen here, which contracts get executed and how they get closed and how this kind of work. So you all you all doing that uh, using the rep tokens, right? So rep is the kind of a governance token for managing the DAO and opening and closing some of the collateral pools. Uh, there is more to it. So this is a very simplified view because in fact, when you create a, a pool, uh, and you lock ether, you cannot really lock ether directly because that would be inefficient. Uh, because uh, every operation on ether incurs ether fees and ether uh, gas. So what usually happens is you try to isolate yourself from the layer one. So instead of using ether directly, you may want to use kind of ERC20 token that you can manipulate without incurring kind of a high uh, transaction costs on the layer one, right? So this is kind of a layer one, but here in the DAO, often we want to operate on layer two. So we want, for example, ERC20 token, which is, for example, ROP Ether, right? So ROP Ether is a kind of a stable coin, which is packed to Ether, uh, which is done the, the normal collateral way. Uh, and it is released as an ERC20 token. Uh, so on Ethereum, you can release multiple tokens, right? So Ethereum has a native token, which is Ether, but you can kind of uh, use smart contracts to generate any new token you want. And there is like a standard way of doing it. So the, um, the community defined like an API, uh, what kind of a token looks like that has like a mnemonic, it has a total amount, it has some properties. So there are a couple of um, smart contract calls that every contract needs to implement. It's kind of like an interface. And if you implement that interface, you are ERC20 compliant. And what it means that all the wallets and everybody in the world can interact with your coin the same way as with the other coin. And then exchanging it or you, uh, doing a wallet service or storage service is very easy, right? So this is kind of like a standard in which most stable assets are being released on Ethereum. Uh, and then this is kind of a layer which allows kind of isolation because exchanging ERC20 tokens doesn't incur a normal ether fees. It incurs gas for the smart contract, but you don't have um, uh, you know additional costs. So so you have apart from those which are listed there, you may have to do something like with uh, dropped tokens, and then if you lock this rock token into into a pool then whoever locked that into the pool gets another uh, another token uh, let's call it psi uh, which uh, represents the amount locked in the pool for the collateral and then those tokens get manipulated internally in the in the DAO itself to you know um, make sure that the balances are kind of accurate and on top of that, usually there are some fees because those people, those investors who kind of invest into the pool, they want some profit. So there are certain fees that are kind of put on top of that, right? So overall, the picture is quite complicated and I don't want to, um, I, I would need to spend like an entire lecture or two to uh, dive into all the details of how it exactly works. But if you want to know more, you can, uh, you can dive into that and read more a little bit about it and then as i said we may have a lecture on the uh, how the maker dao actually works internally if, if we manage uh, with time so this is kind of like a um uh, a simple reminder and just a takeaway from this is that the dai uh, is the uh, the stable coin um and then uh, rep, uh or um maker are the kind of a governance tokens which are used for managing it so with dai and maker now the token actually is called maker right uh yeah um what we see with these tokens that people probably think is a meme uh because they can find people so uh that one way that you can Yeah, so that is, uh, it, it kind of depends on the project and I don't know exactly how it happened with MakerDAO, 
but usually you have uh, some developers which are designing the smart contracts uh, and then some of the governance is kind of coded in. So sometimes you have a project which says we not fully decentralized yet, we kind of working towards decentralization, which means some of the decisions they make as a team and they kind of hard code some of the things. But sometimes you have uh, a developer who kind of put everything into smart contract and then the contract makes the decisions. So based on the, some of the conditions and some of the oracles, the contract itself makes the decisions of what, what happens. Yeah. So it's kind of up to you, right? So uh, if you're very careless, uh, you just wrote your contract, you deploy it on mainnet, and then some hackers will hack it, and then you kind of say, oh, yeah, that was a problem. <laughs> and somebody will lose funds, right? Yeah. Uh, if you want, you can hire the companies. So you can say, I deployed this contract in testnet. Can you please audit it? And then you pay them, and they kind of audit it, validate you, that everything is fine, and uh, assess your risks. So sometimes the contract is working, but nobody is going to tell you this contract will always work correctly, right? They will say, okay, we have not identified any risks. Um, we have not identified any faults, but those are the risks. Like for example, and then you may have some uh, list of like uh, how the keys are managed or like what is your responsibility, what can go wrong. So they can give you like a report. Um, there are all, also automated tools. So there are some uh, developer tools which you can uh, use like a sort of like a smart compiler. So you tell the compiler, okay, this is my, uh, my code, my Solidity code, and it will analyze it and it will hi highlight some of the key points, some security aspects or some, uh, uh, some like, sa same as we have in kind of uh, development environments for Golang and so on. It highlights, okay, you could use this or you could do that and, and so on, right? So there are some automation um, tools which allow you to do some uh, um, audit of your contract as well. The, the problem is usually not with a single contract. So single contract usually is kind of easy to validate uh, because you can kind of predict the behavior of the, of the single contract. The problem becomes when you have kind of complex projects which have multiple moving parts. And then it's sort of like with concurrent programming. Like if you have a single threaded program, it's kind of easier to understand the logic and what's going on. If you have a multi-threaded program with a lot of things kind of uh, independent, sometimes you have race condition, right? And the race condition is kind of hard to debug. Uh, so with smart contract is similar, like sometimes each individual part is kind of secure and working okay, but in combination you have certain conditions which make the hacker able to exploit some of the dynamics of the, of the properties of the smart contracts, because you do need to have some uh, timeouts, you, you do need to have some uh, time dependencies and so on, and certain things are kind of atomic, so they cannot um, you cannot allow an inconsistent state. And that's what usually fails, right? So you end up in a hacker doing something in the system, to produce an inconsistent result, and then the hacker benefits or, or something goes wrong, right? Um, so it, it kind of depends. I don't know exactly how MakerDAO did it, but um, MakerDAO didn't have any problems and they kind of launched their version one and then they improved it, but they didn't have kind of um, and hiccups, and I'm not sure if they hired like a audit company to do the initial audit. I, I think so, yeah. It, it is a little bit costly. So a kind of a thorough, uh, a thorough check of some um, small solidity project will cost you probably about $10,000, uh, yeah. So you can find some companies which advertise services like that. Yeah. 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 So, so that's not very risky. Exactly. Yeah. So, if you want to launch your own shit coin, <laughs> it's like, you know, you probably can do it like really easily. Uh, there are some tutorials how to do it, and the ERC20 token are very simple. Like, not nothing really can go wrong. Uh, so if you're just doing like a release of a new token, you can kind of easily do that. Yeah, uh, that's why we have so many shit coins, right? Because it is easy. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. 
So let's move on. Uh, let's move on to the next topic, uh, prediction markets. So as I said, we kind of jumping from topic to topic, but we need to remember that uh, they are composable. And in fact, you kind of seen that to do a stable coin, we needed another stable coin, <laughs> right? So to do MakerDAO stable coin, we used Rob Ether, which is another stable coin, which is using like the fixed collateral uh, mechanism, right? Okay, so prediction markets, uh, question to you. Uh, what they are for? What do you think? What can we use prediction market or what is that concept all about? Any suggestions? Ideas, resource allocation, that's a good one, yeah. So, resource allocation, what else? What else can you tell me about prediction markets? Any Zoom people saying comments, no. Huh? Trading what? So, uh, of, of course, trading. Uh, assets. So, it is a market because it says, you know, market. <laughs> so, we're going to trade some things, uh, but what is that we are trading? Well, you know, predictions, <laughs> right? So we're trading predictions. Um, <laughs> all right, so we have, um, yes, predicting the state of the market in the near future. So predictions is the keyword here, right? So, uh, yeah. Uh, which kind of boils down to what? What is usually that we are predicting? Price, right? So usually by predicting the state of the market, we kind of have to do something with the price prediction, right? Or some index prediction or some chance prediction, right? Um, Excellent. So um, if we move to the ones that I uh, said, I had gambling as well. There was gambling there. Um, price and risk determination. So that's exactly what this is, right? So that's, that's what this is. It is partially that as well, right? Uh, because uh, the resource in financial markets usually is finance. And then by doing this type of prediction, we're kind of allocating some resources somewhere, right? Uh, and then we have this kind of a risk, uh, risk or chance uh, uh, offsetting. So imagine that we have this uh, exercise with the farmer, which we did last, last week, right? Uh, so I'm the um, wine uh, grape farmer, and I have a certain chance of my crop being unused, right? So again, if I say, uh, okay, there is a small chance, what I don't remember how, how small we said. 5%, yeah. So there is a 5% chance that my crop is gonna be useless. So it's a very small percentage. And then we, we basically said that uh, if, uh, if I allocate uh, some pool of money, right? So I say, okay, I'm allocating, um, I don't know, um, 100 into the pool. And then if you, um, if you pay five, so you have to allocate 100 as well, right? So I'm, I, I, I'm looking for counterparty, right? So then the counterparty allocates 100 as well. Uh, and then I have allocated five to 95, right? Which means um, you have to, uh, um, I, I will pay you five in case the weather is fine, nothing happened, right? 
Uh, so you you're gonna uh, win five if the um, uh, no yeah that's right and then the when the opposite happens then the other party gets ninety five right and you're doing the same but with the reverse order and then we kind of even if the chance is uh, is exactly five percent if the chance is like higher or lower then we can kind of uh, change the equation and kind of uh, have this setup right um, so prediction market is exactly this right so one one counterparty sets uh, a certain uh, pool of resource and saying i'm gonna pay you this if this event happens uh, otherwise you're gonna pay me if this event doesn't happen right so then i'm offsetting my chance of losing all my crops because then if that happens i get some reimbursement back from you right otherwise i pay you if nothing bad happens um, so we can do the same for gambling right you may say um, you may say i uh i bet that uh, i'm gonna get a in this course right so i'm putting again kind of a ratio of some sort um so i don't know uh student student a uh, okay a is a, a kind of a suggested name so, so student bob <laughs> uh says uh um i'm gonna uh put um uh, 20 to 80 right so if i get a uh you're gonna get uh 80 right if i don't get a uh you have to pay me 20 right so i'm kind of a uh, creating a market uh and doing it purely for gambling right and then if the student is really good and there is a high chance of the student getting a then the ratio has to be kind of uh, in favor of somebody risking small amount and get, gaining a lot if the student is not uh, an A student, then the risk is very small. So then, you know, it's almost guaranteed that you're going to win the, the other part. So the ratio has to be kind of more 50-50, right? Uh, so depending what you predict, the, the odds are changing here, right? And what you can do is you can offer that. So when, when you do this, you can say, OK, uh, I'm Bob, and I, I have created a 100 um, hundred tokens on each side of the bet right uh, th this one is worth 20 and this one is worth 80 uh, and now uh, this there is a market and then you can buy the stakes what do you think will the student so this is uh if the student um yeah if the student gets a uh that side wins and then uh, not not a less than a this side wins right um, so what what does it mean uh it means that this student is quite good uh the chances of the um of the 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 winning are kind of up they they cost uh the the original set is that they cost quite a lot right um so now if people think yeah that student is not actually that good right so they start buying this so if the if the people like start buying from that pool uh we have kind of an equation here which kind of uh, balances the price so if now like more people bought from here so now let's say uh i have people buying that so i ended up with 90 versus 100 i have this resource kind of dropping right so originally I had a price of 20 for a hundred, but now I only have 90 of that. So I have to update the price, right? So what will happen to that price, that, that price will go up, right? So if people are buying here, that will go up and the ratio will, will you know, change, right? So it means like currently we have one to four uh, that this student will get A, but as, as the people vote by buying this, this side, the ratio will change and it'll be one to three, maybe one to two, right? Uh, if they start selling this, the same will happen, right? So if there are people who already have this and kind of are put more into it, the price will go down, right? So by, by changing the price, by buying and, and selling the, the kind of the, the votes, uh, the ratio, the kind of the odds are gonna change here as well, right? And 
Okay, so we go to the next one. So we have a concept of my market maker. So as with the wine uh, producer or as with the student, they are the initial ma market maker. They created the market, right? So I can say who's gonna win the next, um, yeah, the elections already happened in Norway, but in some country, right? Who's gonna win the kind of different parties and who's gonna win? That's, I'm creating a market and I'm setting the initial ratios, right? Because I have to put my money into it, right? I have to create this liquidity and I have to create that initial market. So the farmer or the student or me are the initial market maker and we put the initial capital in, right? Uh, what can happen is um, you have then traders and, and uh, buy and sell uh, positions. So once the market is created, there are traders who buy and sell the, the value. Uh, you can actually have uh, a decentralized market making, right? I can be the initial market maker, but then you can put your own money into it, right? So when I created this initial market for the... Uh, for the uh, for the student A for Bob, right? I'm the teacher, and I said, okay, uh, Bob is gonna get A with uh, four to one, okay? And you can bet against it or for it, right? And I created the the, the market, and I created hundreds tokens on each side of the equation. And you say, okay, I am gonna uh, also help you with the market. I'm gonna provide liquidity to the market. I'm not gonna bet myself on on either side of the equation. I'm just gonna add more liquidity, right? But uh, you, can, you can do that without violating the ratio, or you can say, I want to put all my liquidity on that side because I don't think it's one to four. I think it's kind of a one to two, right? So if the, um, if the new uh, investor adds extra 100 worth tokens on that side, we will gonna end up with 200 on that side and 100 on that side. And initially the, the individual token was worth eight, 80 um, uh, for the price, right? But now because we have doubled that, now the price went to 40, right? So the market is kind of the same, but because somebody invested on that side, the ratio changed. So now we have one to two ratio, right? Uh, because somebody kind of put more capital on one of the sides. Some liquidity pools allow you to do that. Some liquidity pools enforce you to bet on both sides such that you are taking the same risk as the original market maker, right? Uh, because the second one is now taking less risk if indeed the, that student is not that good, right? Uh, so the initial investor already lost some capital because the price just went down, right? Uh, for the for this for the hundred that they originally had. All right, so uh, we have uh, also the liquidity providers here. Uh, then there is a kind of a market closure, right? So at the end of the semester, the student actually got the grade, and then the market closes, right? Because there is no more predicting the event happened, right? So it's the same with presidential elections or lotteries or some gambling or whatever, right? There, there is a certain amount of unknown, 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 and then there is a determination, right? Uh, usually the closer you get to the outcome, the, the more knowledge people have and the more precise the betting is, right? So like if you, um, if you have, uh, for example, the World Cup, Soccer World Cup, initially you, you can bet on all the games in, in the future. And the odds are calculated certain way, right? Uh, and you may have uh, you may have some underdog, uh, and you may have a ratio of one to ten thousand, right? So they say, okay, if that underdog becomes a World Cup champion, you pay one dollar and you win ten thousand dollars, right? But as the World Cup progresses and this underdog climbs the ladder and becomes like to quarterfinals and to semifinals, like you know. In semifinals, the ratio will be not one to 10,000 anymore. It will be maybe one to 1,000 or one to 100, right? Because it already went so far, right? And if they get to like, uh, you know, finals and they're fighting for the first place, okay, then the underdog may be one to two, right? Uh, the, the favorite will be, you know, two to one and the underdog one to two, right? Uh, so as you kind of get closer, the, the, the odds will change and the market will change and the predictions will change. 
and then you have the closure. Uh, and then after the closure, closure, you know, everybody gets paid, right? So in the context of the student, like one one side loses the the money, and the other one takes everything and distributes among themselves. In the case of the farmer, uh, if the uh, risk or the insurance company uh, th there was no um, frost and the grapes are fine, the insurance company gets a little bit of money. If there was frost, the insurance company pays the uh, the farmer. All right. So um, here we have some examples of uh, prediction markets. Uh, for uh, in stock market, we have the, the futures. Uh, so those are the indexes which uh, kind of a predict. So so you have certain. Um, uh, so so for example, if we go, yeah, if we go to um, oil price, right. So if, if I looked up the kind of the current uh, crude oil price of a commodity today, right? Uh, so they tell me, okay, the price is um, uh, 84.48, right? Um, this is the, the price for a barrel of oil, which is today, uh, but the price is not, um, uh, yeah, oil is kind of not that, yeah, let's say gold. Yeah, so you have, um, current price, yeah. So current price is this, um, and you would think, okay, so that is the actual current price today, right? Uh, but it's kind of not really. Uh, so the, the markets work in, in a way that uh, you have kind of the uh, price of the asset kind of uh, as, as if you were to buy it today. And then you have kind of the index of what it will be at certain closure time, right? So that price, so, so that, there is a bit of a duality. Like you, from one hand, you're betting your money on the price that's going to be on the closure of the contract which will be kind of in a certain time, like in 30 days or so. On the other hand, you have the current price of what it is worth on the market right now, right? So you have the future, which is the, the future contract, which is what will the gold price be on 1st of November, 2021, right? Or 1st of December, 2021. Usually the futures in the, in the market work every month or every two months. So that there are different kind of durations of what is the contract. And then at the end of the contract, they kind of close it and open the next contract, right? So you have this kind of a rollover uh, concept, right? Um, so we we have, um, oops, I closed something wrong. So you have the, um, the commodities, which we kind of do futures on, and you can also do futures of stock, right? So you have Apple stock, which is worth something today, and you can say, okay, I don't want to buy Apple stock. I want to buy a difference in price between the price of which is today and 1st of December. And then you're betting what the difference of the price will be, right? So then you have kind of a contract on a difference, right? And then you can say the price will go up or the price will go down and how much, and then you're betting what that would be. And other, other people are betting. And then on 1st December, we have the determination. We know what the price is. And then some people will lose and some people will gain depending how good your prediction was, right? Um, so those are the kind of the futures. Uh, and then of course you have um, sport or event betting, like what's gonna be with the weather or what's gonna be with the sport event and, and so on. And all sorts of uh, other forms of betting, right? So for example, if Bob is gonna get A in the course. Um, yeah, so uh, someone, let me see who that was. Someone pointed out, yeah, Ben uh, pointed out that it's kind of a perfect for some of the insider trading. Uh, if you have kind of a prediction market that you have some insider knowledge of what it's gonna be, right? So for example, if I'm the lecturer and I'm giving the grades <laughs> and there is a huge, and I betted a lot about the student not getting an A, then of course I can win, right? Because I, I set the price, uh, I set the result, right? 
Uh, it's a little bit similar with the negotiations about oil prices. Uh, OPEC meets every now and then and decides what to do. And then depending what they decide, uh, the price of oil goes up or down. So if you know yeah, how strong arguments they will have and who is leaning which way, you can kind of predict if the price of oil will go up or down and you can bet some money and then you can kind of make a lot of money, right? So insider trading in general is um, illegal. So if the uh, investigators can demonstrate that somebody was you know, trading with the insider knowledge, that's kind of uh, illegal. But at the same time, it's quite hard sometimes to find out and to prosecute that, right? Uh, so, sorry? The meeting dates are very important and they kind of dictate uh, for the general market what's gonna happen. But for the insider, insider trading, they usually know ahead of the meetings, right? So that those events happen kind of before, um, yeah. All right, so then um, we have Ogur. Uh, so if we open a tab and you go Ogur, yeah, so it's a portal to betting on different things. You can bet on crypto, you can bet on, oops. Uh, you can bet on MMA events, sport events, and NFL, um, and other, other kind of uh, markets. So if we, for example, look into crypto, yes, I acknowledge that I gonna lose money. <laughs> uh, you can look into the different markets that people have created. And you can create the, the market yourself, right? So if you are this uh, Bob, you can come to Ogre and you can create a market for whether you're gonna get A or not. Uh, and then people can buy the shares of either yes or no answer, right? Uh, and then depending on the initial uh, volume, like you have a certain liquidity of what's at stake, right? Because depending how many people are participating and how big the pool is, you're gonna win a certain amount of money, right? So yeah, uh, so this is uh, the IPFS uh, link to the uh, permanent storage on IPFS network with the web gate gateway. So that's a kind of a hash of a content which is stored on IPFS network, which is the, the source of that website, right? So the hash is constant for that service, yes, yeah. Such that people cannot fake it, right? So when you created a service, you can uh, log it like, uh, you know IPFS? Yeah, so IPFS is content addressable uh, storage. Uh, and then you can deploy your application on IPFS like the uh, static content, such that nobody else can kind of uh, DNS spoof you or uh, fake your content, right? To pretend that it's their legitimate website. Uh, and here we have, uh, for example, on um, uh, yeah, so we have a bet like, will it settle above 3,983 at the end of 29th of October, right? So we have a settlement date, which is uh, 10 p.m. of 29th of October. And if the price is above that, then the yes will win. If the price is below below that, then the no will win. And once the no's win, they, they take all the stake that was put onto yes and distribute it among the no's, right? So you can expect that if you put uh, one, one dollar in and the no wins, you win 59 cents because you invested kind of one dollar. So 41 uh, was your kind of, um, your you know, initial, <laughs> risk and then 59 will be your kind of your gain, right? Um, you, you will see that the price kind of rounds up to a dollar, which is equivalent of uh, roughly speaking, how many people think the one yes will win or no, right? So, but the price doesn't have to round up to a dollar in which case to calculate the odds, you would have to check the ratio between the prices, right? Yeah. 
So in Augur, they try to uh, present the odds like using the kind of a monetary value here. Uh, and then if you want to buy, then you're buying for that price. But once you bought it for that price, the price will change, right? So depending how many people are buying, if uh, many people buy on that price, that price will go down and down and down, right? Uh, if, the, if more people kind of uh, uh, buy here, that price will go up. Uh, of course, when you bought it, you bought it for a certain amount. So when you bought it, you bought it for right now, you bought it for 41 cents, right? Uh, if the price goes up, that doesn't matter for you because you've already paid, right? And then it, you're gonna win a dollar, right? So no matter how much you, you uh, uh, like, so if, if you were betting on yes, you would have to pay 59 cents, which means you would win, if, if you win, you win, win a dollar back. So you made 41 cents, right? That makes sense, right? Yeah. So you can check that out. Uh, it's, uh, you can easily make any bet you want. Uh, and um, all the payments and most of the kind of a uh, stake happens with, with crypto, of course, because it's much more convenient. Um, but you can create kind of an arbitrary event, right? Uh, that can be determined. Um, so let's move on. So it's a decentralized prediction market that anybody can open. Uh, it's more similar to financial market than betting, right? Because you have those uh, yes and no staking and you're kind of operating on the assets as if they were kind of a financial market, right? So it's not like a lottery that you kind of put your money on a bet and nothing happens. It's, you can actually trade. So you can trade your odds. You, you can trade the tokens that you bought. Uh, you can sell them back. Right, so if you bought, um, you know, if, if you bought uh, the, the no answer for 41 cents, right? Uh, and then the price goes up, right? Then you can kind of sell it back and then make money on just buying and selling the, the tokens instead of actually waiting for the closure of the market, right? So if many people think that uh, Ether will not close at that price, the price will go up. And at some point it may go for like 49, then you may actually sell your tokens because you bought them for 41 and you can sell them back for 49. So you've made 0 0.8 cents just by trading the, the odds, right? Um, so market maker creates the, the market, buyers and sellers stake the liquidity or provide liquidity into the market. And then the market is closed, right? The closure of the market is kind of interesting. Um, Okay, so first, the, the Ogur has three types of markets. So the ones that you've seen, which is yes or no, which is very simple. Um, you can have this concept extended to more than two answers, right? So if you have a yes or no, that's kind of a special case of a more generic one where you have, you know, answer A, answer B, answer C or D, right? And then you're staking what will happen. And then at the end, one of those will happen and then all the others will kind of not happen, lose the, the odds, right? So the, the tool is a special case of the more general kind of a multi-answer question type of thing, uh, out of which only one answer is correct, right? So with the multi-choice, multiple answers, at the end of the market closure, only one of them will be correct, right? So for example, if there are presidential elections and we have four candidates, we could create a market with four candidates, right? to go to the um, voting, right? What? Um, and then the third one is a scalar market. A scalar market is a little bit more interesting because instead of asking, so the, the question that was there was, it was ether price about a certain value. So we asked me, what, will the price be above 3000, okay? Uh, so that's the yes, no, uh, yes, no market. Uh, but what we can say also is we can say how different will be the price from 2000. And now we have a scalar market, right? Because at 3000, we have the perfect answer. And then the further left or right you go, the, the, the more error you have in your answer, right? And then whoever is the closest may get the most reward and then whoever is further will get less. So you can kind of uh, distribute the rewards using a bell curve or some other mechanism, right? 
or linear or whatever you want. So you have kind of a, a, a way uh, to express kind of a gradual um, answer such that you're not voting yes or no, you're voting on a number, right? So you can say, uh, actually that already vote, right? So you're voting where the price will be. And then once the price happens, it's, it's a number and then you are either far away. Yeah, you are exactly. Yes, that, that is true because uh, of the gambling laws, right? So in some jurisdictions, they are considered a gambling site and they would have to have a license. Uh, and in some jurisdictions, they are considered the prediction market or some other term, which doesn't require a license. So it is not available in all countries. That's correct. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, um, okay, so the, the determination. Um, Let's, uh, so the final point is the market is closed and now comes the term. So um, there is, uh, so there is a small problem, okay? Uh, with decentralized market, uh, prediction market. So um, let's say we have the, the Bob situation, right? Uh, and then uh, the Bob created the market and then people uh, put some uh, stake on that side and on that side of the market. And then at the end of the semester, Bob comes and logs in and Bob logs in that he got A, okay? Uh, into the system. And now, uh, you know, did Bob get A, right? Uh, you don't know, right? Uh, so you need to check. Right, so you can call the lecturer or you can check the transcript, whatever, right? And there is a period of time where you can uh, lodge a complaint. You can say, actually, A didn't happen, right? Bob didn't got A. Uh, I have an evidence that Bob didn't got A. So what happens is uh, Bob logs A and he logs it with a certain stake and he bets some money on that, on that outcome. And you, if you verified the, the claim, you can either ignore it and agree that, okay, Bob got A, but if you call the lecturer and you say, did Bob really got A? And say, no, no, Bob got B, right? Then you say, okay, wait a minute. Uh, I'm, I'm lodging kind of a first complaint and I'm putting, uh, you, you have to put uh, more money than Bob. So, so there are some algorithms like how it works, but usually you put some stake as well and you say, no, Bob got B, right? So you log in kind of an alternative. Uh, so he, he logs this, and then you log in kind of uh, an alternative. And we need a resolution, right? And now the resolution waits for, uh, for more people to vote, right? So now people can vote either on this or this, uh, or can even go and say, no, he got C, right? Uh, so at, at some point, um, that, that is allowed, uh, in, in over it's allowed to like 16 rounds. Uh, you can kind of uh, continue this staking and kind of voting up to a very large amount of money such that at, at some point there will be so much money lo like logged in this voting on what happened that will overcome like the, the you know, this, right? So then uh, whoever decision is voted, it's kind of like a prediction market again, right? It's a meta level prediction market of what has happened, right? What has happened. Uh, and then the outcome of that, basically those people who voted on the correct answer will get all the money from everybody else who voted on the answer, which was considered wrong, right? Uh, and then, uh, the, you know, those people will lose money. So if there was another one voting on C, uh, with some money, then they will lose all the money and the money will be distributed to those voters who voted for the correct answer. Is that a correct answer? Well, maybe, right? So it basically goes to the person who has the most money, right? Uh, it, which may be the, the correct answer, but it may not be, right? If there is like a very wealthy investor who wants to outbet everybody with the wrong answer, technically they could kind of do that, right? So that's the, that's the price determination. All right, so we went for over an hour. Uh, so before we go into the uh, market maker uh, 
discussion. Let's have a short break. I will pause the stream. Um, so Ben, did you want to ask something? Did you say no? I'm not sure if my... Uh... Yeah, so, so just type, type if you have a question. Uh, all right, so... Um, we basically uh, have two types of market makers. So one type of market maker is like with the traditional sport betting. If you go to a bookmaker, uh, you tell them like they, they tell you what the odds are and you can buy this match or that match or that course or that course and, and so on, right? So those are kind of a human. Uh, so there is like a, a human element which sets the market uh, and, and also sets the market odds and then adjust it. Uh, so the uh, humans are fine, but we try to have decentralized systems where we kind of eliminate the humans, right? So we want everything done automatically and uh, without the humans in the loop. So the uh, here, the uh, yeah, the first type is kind of like human-based market makers, and then we have the kind of an automated market makers. So an automated market maker is basically an algorithm or some program that sets the price based on the logic of that program. So there is no human kind of uh, who is setting the, the price, right? I mean, initially with this type of Bob uh, or with Ogun, uh, the initial market maker, uh, the human kind of who creates the market sets the initial price. So that is kind of the input to the, to the process. But then the price of the asset. So once the initial, um, once the initial stake is kind of uh, created, everything that follows is automated. Whereas in the, uh, uh, with, and, and it, it is automated and kind of, uh, uh, so if we have, so if we have, for example, um, uh, the, this uh, World Cup situation, right? And we have those of one to 10,000, right? Initially. Uh, so then uh, this is, let's say time. Uh, so if, Somebody kind of uh, bets uh, for that for that here uh, in, in T1, and somebody bets T2. Usually, the price is the same, right? With the human-based kind of market makers, the price so that the price is at ten thousand up to a certain point, uh, and then at some point the price may drop, and then again be kind of a constant for uh, for. So usually that that price is fixed until some sort of event, maybe quarterfinals or something, results are, are due and then the, the market makers will change the price. And then again, it's kind of fixed, right? Uh, so this is like the human. Uh, with the automated uh, market makers, what usually happens, you have the initial price that was set by the, by the initial market maker, and then the price will either go up or go down depending on what the, uh, what is happening with the buying and selling. So every buy, every buy, every sell will change the price and the price will fluctuate dynamically for every single um, event in the system, right? So then we have kind of a, a special type of automated market makers, which is a constant, um, constant um, market maker function. Uh, that basically means that the function is the same, that functions the same way all the time, right? Uh, so this, the, the determination of the, of the price is done by some function f, which took that initial point as a parameter. And then everything that follows is kind of uh, always the same. It's like uh, if you did the, uh, the functional programming course, it means that the, the function is pure, right? It, nothing influences the function. Uh, nothing from outside. Of course, the, uh, the buying and selling influences it, but that's it, right? Uh, so to give you an example of non-constant function, uh, you may, for example, consider a function of, uh, if we have some sort of a lending, uh, lending situation, 
And then we have some uh, liquidity providers providing liquidity for borrowers, right? Uh, and then you have some borrowers with uh, lower risk and some bor borrowers with higher risk. And then you have some uh, some collateral for the for the borrowers. And then there is some percentage which kind of uh, flows to the original liquidity providers, and maybe some percentage that flows in terms of fees for the service provider. Uh, then you have a certain uh, function of how it works. So the fees could be uh, the fees could be fixed, or the fixed the fees could be adjustable depending on the risk that somebody is taking. So you may have kind of a function that takes the usual set of parameters like the, the, the fixed set of parameters plus this kind of uh, additional things that are taken into account to either rise or, or, or lower some of the other parameters which are kind of for that function. And that function F then it would not be constant. It would be kind of adjusted uh, because you have um, you have kind of like a, two functions, right? You have that fixed function plus you have those kind of a changeable parameters which make the whole function kind of impure. Like that part is pure, but that extra part is not anymore, right? Okay, so we have a couple of examples of um, uh, constant function make market makers functions. <laughs> So the, the most popular is the logarithmic market scoring rule, uh, which was kind of designed in 2002. Uh, and it has been used in Oldburg and Gnosis. So those are two projects which are doing this kind of prediction markets. And they are based on the uh, logarithmic market scoring rule. Although uh, some uh, learning tool of Oldburg may be using uh, a constant product map, right? So that this one and this one are kind of very popular in DeFi uh, and they differ slightly, right? That one is kind of uh, using a concept of logarithms uh, and the curves are slightly different. And then you have the, uh, the constant product market uh, later. What's the difference? Well, if you think about it, um, we have, let, let's go back to the student student case. Um, so how is the, let me see myself if the, if the people see the whiteboard. Yeah. So if we have the original student, right? So let's say uh, the, the box set created the market and he said uh, with the odds one to four, uh, I have the price of 20 and 80, and he created, let's say, 100 tokens on each side of the, of the market, right? And now uh, someone comes in and buys uh, some of the 80, right? So someone thinks that it's more likely that uh, he will get 80, right? So here is A and not, not A. No. A, not A minus. Okay. Um, so then, if someone comes here and buys some of those uh, stakes, then let's say about 10. So now we have 90, and here we still have 100. So now uh, the 90 are worth more because originally we only had 100. Uh, we had 10 more, right? So the price now, the new price, so the, the old price here kind of stays. And the new price here has to be higher than 80, right? Uh, to, to kind of balance it, you would think that, right? So then there are kind of a different ways of doing that. One, the, the simplest one is the, um, so you have, um, you're keeping the price um, of um, kind of using the relation of the say yes and no. Uh, you have some sort of linear uh, linear function, which initially sets the price kind of here, right? And then when one of them goes up, the other one goes down, kind of in a linear relationship, right? So you, you have kind of this, and then if, if somebody bought here, then you kind of uh, increase the, the yes, increase the yes price and decreases the no price, 
in kind of a linear relationship. So you, you say, okay, I will have new price here. So the new price for, for yes is here and new price for no is here. And then I have kind of the kind of a constant, but I re readjusted the prices of both of those assets if we bought them, right? Uh, and then the problem with the linear one is that uh, if somebody really thinks uh, he will get A, right? So what it will do, it, it will set the price of no to zero and price of uh, yes to the maximum. And that's capped, right? And you want to pre prevent that. You want to be more smooth than that, right? So the constant product, uh, instead of, of using plus, is using a multiplication. And then the curve, instead of kind of a straight line, is more like this, right? So what happens is, if the if the like um, you, you start reaching close to zero on, on one side, then the price of yes goes higher and higher towards infinity, right? So it kind of goes towards infinity uh, and then kind of towards zero, but it never reaches that. You will never reach infinity and you will never reach zero, right? So the, you, you cannot kind of uh, dump one price to zero and kind of have the other one inflated because you have this harder and harder kind of a uh, slope to buy a little bit more to dump the price like the uh, the influence of buying you have to buy quite a lot right so you you kind of buying quite a lot here but you're getting a very small change change of price kind of on the other asset right if the price gets into this kind of exponential um uh, so so the constant product is again you kind of are starting here and then once this is 90, then you kind of moving the price a little bit to keep the, the amount of assets kind of constant. So the uh, usually they say X and Y, and then the constant is kind of K, and they say the multiplication of the original assets is always the same value. No matter what happens with the price, it will kind of be always at the same value as it was originally there. The, the difference will be in price, but the total value will kind of retain the same amount, right? Um, so that's the kind of a uh, uh, constant product market maker. And Uniswap is using it, and I think Ogre uh, version two is using it as well. Uh, and some uh, liquidity pools in DEXs and other DEXs than Uniswap are using it as well. And then we, we have two in the middle, which is a Bayesian market maker and dynamic pari mutual market maker. So those are kind of are used in the normal financial markets very often. Uh, and this one is used for horse racing. And this one is usually used in kind of a yes, no markets, binary markets. All right. Um, so apart from this, this curve of the constant function market maker, sometimes people talk about bonding curve. And the bonding curve is not a relationship between the two sides of, of an asset. It's a bonding curve is the relationship between the token price and token supply. So if you think about it, it's what we talked about last week, where we were talking about stable coins, where you have a certain amount of coins. So you have certain amount of coins and they are worth uh, X. And now somebody kind of up you know, uses them or dumps them, and that influences the price. And depending on the uh, supply uh, and demand, um, you want to introduce kind of new tokens or take tokens out of the market, right? So again, you have some sort of a ratio. Uh, you, you will have some sort of a ratio between the amount, amount of tokens and the price of the tokens which will be kind of, you know, as um, uh, the amount, the demand for the amount kind of um, is, yeah, so the, the tools will look differently. Um, so, the, um, yeah, so the more tokens you have, if you have infinite amount of tokens, they will be worth zero, right? So also have kind of uh, things like this. And then if you only have 
very small number of tokens, it will, the price will go into infinity. Uh, so then when you are kind of somewhere on the, on the curve uh, and the price changes, then the amount needs to kind of get adjusted. So you're not adjusting, uh, I mean, you're adjusting the amount in relation to the uh, change of price, right? So if we, um, if, if, if we are originally here and uh, let's say this is like 100, and then on the open market, the price goes to 120. So now the price is here. So you have kind of a, you see that you have to take out of the market a certain amount of points to kind of uh, de like realign the price to the, to the curve, right? Uh, because you are kind of outside of the curve. And being outside of the curve means that the, uh, the value of the tokens now is kind of, um, uh, deflated, right? You have too much value for the amount that you have in the market. So you're doing that with the manipulation of the uh, supply uh, of the tokens. All right, so then there is one more uh, um, concept, which is uh, price slippage. So that's, um, so, you know, we, we have this kind of constant. Um, and then that, that person kind of buys the, buys the token, which kind of a change, change the price. So there is, um, so there is, there are two orders, let's say. So order one is by, by, so yes, right? So by yes. Okay, are we buying 10 of yeses? The second order is by uh, notes, right? So what will happen if we uh, swap the order of those two orders, right? So if that, that one goes first, uh, the price of no goes down, and then the second one buys the no's cheaper, right? If we, and uh, vice versa. So this is uh, first order. Second order. This one decreases the price, uh, and this one increases this price, right? So depending which one goes first, the other one is kind of screwed, right? Because it's the, the market moves in the opposite direction, right? So overall, like after those two, maybe not, nothing changes to the price, but while it's, it's happening, the order matters, right? And which one goes first, which one goes second. So that's called like the difference in the price between this person make, makes an order and this person makes an order and which order is executed first kind of ends up with the price slippage. And the price slippage is kind of uh, caused by the transaction time, like which transaction gets in first, which one is included in the blockchain first and so on. Some of those elements are unpredictable. Uh, and then what you should do is you should kind of uh, allow that if the price slippage is bigger than certain delta, you don't want that order to go in, right? To pr protect yourself from a really big price slippage, right? So you will say, okay, I, I can take some risk of the price kind of being different than I think what it is, uh, but I don't want it to be bigger than a certain delta, right? If it is bigger than delta, then don't execute my trade, right? Don't execute that order. Um, all right, uh, there is, um, so this is one type of price slippage. There is another one. So imagine that um, imagine that I told you we have kind of a binary market. Uh, again, maybe with 2018. Um, or let, let's even say we have a 50 okay? Uh, and then I have 100 here and 100 here. And then there is a liquidity provider and the liquidity provider uh, puts new value in, right? So in most of the cases, we enforce the liquidity providers to provide liquidity on both sides, such that it doesn't change the ratio and doesn't change the odds, right? Because if it does, then it changes the price, right? So the liquidity provider is for liquidity, uh, but not for changing the price. But sometimes we want to include both. And then imagine that I am putting uh, 100, uh, 100, new tokens on one of the sites, right? So if I put 100 here, then originally I had this at the value of 50 per token, but with 200 now, uh, I changed the price and I also changed the odds, right? 
So do I pay this um, with the original price or with the after price, right? There is a price change. And then if you take into account the price change, what was that value that what it was the first price or the second one? So you may have some situations where you have some form of a price slippage um, uh, because of the way the, the mechanism is done. And then usually, as I said, to prevent or protect against the price slippage, we enforce that the liquidity provider needs to provide liquidity on both ends. It may change the price, uh, but it will change the price on both sides such that overall it should equal, like it should balance to zero. There is another kind of uh, interesting price slippage uh, concept. So, you know, in the uh, NASDAQ or uh, New York Stock Exchange, you're putting orders in, right? So you have a high volume of orders and you have the order book and you are basically saying, I want to buy uh, 1000 of something for the price of uh, 375 or something, right? Um, the, the, the decimal places are on the uh, stock exchange are kind of um, longer than the two decimal places because the, the market is kind of a very fluid, right? So you may have uh, three, two, or even one. You may have more than uh, justified normal decimal places. So you may be betting in the sub cent range, right? And then with the volume of orders, uh, you might be having kind of a, a, a top up, right? So there is like a, so if your, if your total comes to, at the end of the day, you got some, some dollars, blah, 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 comma, and then you got some, you know, I don't know, 59, uh, and then some decimal places. What happens to those decimal places which are after the cents, right? Well, what happens is the exchange takes them. Right, so for every trade that has a sub cent balance, uh, the exchange kind of takes it. And I don't remember the year, but in, in uh, one of the years that I found the publication for, the uh, New York Stock Exchange earned like $2 billion ba based on the sub cent uh, just rounding up, right, uh, or, or taking that. <laughs> so there is a huge, uh, you know, that, that is, it's less than one cent. So you don't care, right? But if you're trading like with millions of people, millions of trades every hour, that adds up to a huge amount of money, right? Uh, so for each individual trade, it doesn't matter because it's less than a cent, but overall it matters a lot. So that also is some sort of a price slippage because the price should include that extra decimal places, right? So in DeFi and in some stock exchanges, they keep your balance on paper with more than one cent decimal uh, places. And only when you withdraw money, they round it up, right? So if you're making thousands of trades, they, you don't lose that uh, decimal places. They are still there. Only when you make the withdrawal, then it is rounded up to one cent because they cannot transfer to your bank less than one cent, right? Um, all right, so that's kind of interesting. Okay, so we almost, um, we have two more topics and one of them is exchanges, but we covered both of the concepts that we needed for an exchange. We basically have all the vocabulary and we have all the um, technology to do an exchange because we've already discussed um, the necessary building blocks. There is a little bit, um, uh, there is a little bit of uh, terminology, right? So again, users, what, what is an exchange? Well, exchanges, uh, you have, let's say, a uh, look to US dollar, right? So you have a certain pool of money. As a liquidity provider, you may provide uh, liquidity. So you edit, let's say, 50,000 look, and that's roughly speaking, I don't know, about 5,000 US dollars. So you provide the liquidity on both sides of the equation. Uh, the total pool is roughly speaking 100k look, right? So that's your kind of a liquidity pool. And now traders can buy and sell uh, your, um, the, the currency, right? Um, so this is with the DeFi, 
with the traditional one, you have no and you have no FB, and you need to wait for people to make an offer, right? So I may come and I will say, okay, I'm willing to sell a uh, hundred MOOC for uh, nine dollars, okay? And then uh, Deeper comes and says, okay, I'm, I'm gonna sell two thousand for eight dollars, right? So somebody, so this is sell, sell. And then somebody comes and have to say, uh, I would buy, uh, I would buy uh, 50, 50 look for, um, for 8.5, right? So now we see, okay, that buy order can be matched with the sell order. Because the sell order is, uh, you know, of, um, is willing to get eight for a loop. Um, yeah, so we need to say it's uh, zero. Uh, uh, how's it? Uh, eight, eight loop for a dollar, right? So eight loop for a dollar, but somebody is willing to pay 8.5, but not with this one, because that order is only willing to accept nine or more, right? So then, okay, there is a match. Uh, we check the amount. So 50 matches this. So we can actually make the trade, right? Um, the, the interesting also question is, will Deepesh get 8.5 or will the exchange take the extra half, <laughs> right? <laughs> so depending also on the exchange, uh, they may uh, give him eight per, per look, but keep the half for themselves, right? Um, or they, they are fair and actually give him the, the actual price, right? Uh, but he was happy with eight, okay? Uh, if that was, say, 20, then we cannot match it because this amount is bigger than this. So what do we do? So we could have partial order, right? So we could partially, uh, partially fulfill that order with this 20, take it out and change this one now to 30 because that sits in the order, right? So the order book model is um, inefficient because it requires the uh, coexistence of buyers and sellers at the same time, right? Um, so the exchange matches the buyers and sellers, uh, and then the market makers, high frequency traders create the liquidity in the middle. We discussed it like in the very beginning. Um, so then uh, centralized exchange, what, is the, what are the advantages? What are the disadvantages? Yeah, so you have uh, the advantages that it's very simple model and very traditional, like we've used it for centuries, like uh, forever. Uh, the disadvantage is that it's a little bit inefficient. And also it, you have to have this coexistence of buyers and sellers and you need these people in the middle, the arbitrage people in the middle. And also it is highly regulated, right? So you have to follow a lot of uh, regulations to have it. I mean, I'm not saying regulations are wrong, uh, but they kind of, are prohibit certain innovations of certain amount of market fluidity, right? So the regulations are designed to uh, protect the um, protect the customers uh, and reduce the risk of, of uninformed public, but often the regulations are also used to limit the um, competitive competitiveness of the market or to kind of uh, work in favor of the old incumbents, right? Old traditional banks. Um, so there are some disadvantages of, in, on, of regulations as well. All right, so then we have uh, some order types. So we can order like uh, the buy can say, okay, I'm gonna buy uh, for the market price, right? I, I need, um, I need uh, 300, uh, I need 300 uh, look and I just, I, I, I go for a market price, right? So what the exchange will do is we'll sell for 200 for eight and then the missing 100 for nine because it has to take the second next best offer for the guy, right? Or, or um, then you can say, okay, I want to buy 300 but I don't want to pay more than 8.5. 
right? And then that's the order limit. So it means, okay, th that one will match, but not the full amount. So then I end up uh, having kind of 100 left with 8.5 and the first 200 is filled with this. Uh, and then I can uh, have some, uh, I can have some more complicated rules saying, okay, I want to sell or I want to buy, uh, I want to buy 300, but I want the, um, I want the best possible price, um, but uh, with a certain, certain buffer, right? So of course the price kind of uh, changes here and I, I may wait for the price. So, so if I bought it right now, I would pay 800 for 200, eight for 200 and then nine for the remaining 100. So they, I don't want to calculate it, but let's say I would pay 8.5, okay? Um, and then I, I, I want to say, okay, I want to set this price. So if this is a price, uh, this is time. This is price. Currently, my price is eight, eight here, eight point five. Okay, and the price may be going, may be going in my favor, so it's getting cheaper, right? So if the price goes in my favor, uh, I want to move that target to have a certain, uh, certain buffer, certain delta that locks the price. So then, when the price goes up. Uh, so let's say the price kind of reached that level here. I had this delta like this, so my price now is here. And when the price goes down and hits that lock now, then I'm gonna buy, right? So then I'm kind of waiting, waiting, waiting. I, I set this kind of a stop loss uh, function. So I'm kind of waiting. And then when that, that happens, I'm, I'm kind of uh, taking the loss, but like the higher than if I would if I took here, right? You get it? More or less, yeah. So you have kind of a take profit or stop loss um, orders. And you can um, do the same. And, and of course you have a price slippage the same as, as before, right? It's exactly the same. And then with the decentralized exchange, we've already kind of created it here. So instead of order book, we kind of ask people to provide liquidity into the pool, right? So uh, I created kind of a liquidity pool. I provided the initial liquidity worth 100K uh, Nook. Uh, and now if the buyer comes and wants to buy Nook, they can buy Nook. If the buyer comes and they want to buy USD, they can buy USD. Uh, and if they want to sell USD, they can sell USD. Uh, so I can uh, accommodate buys and sell orders and every buy and sell order will change my balance here. And using the product constant uh, market function, I will adjust the price. So currently I have a uh, 10 to one price. So uh, 10 look for $1, right? Uh, and then depending what happens with the, with the pool, with the market, how many people are buying or selling USD, then the price will change and it will be kind of manipulated by the algorithm, right? So what is, the, so what is needed? Well, we need some liquidity pool. And, and we need a constant market maker function. Uh, what are the, how it would work? It would work exactly the same as with the other markets that we discussed so far, like with prediction markets, for example. Uh, and what are the advantages? The advantages, it's very simple. It provides kind of liquidity on demand. I don't need to match at the same time sellers and buyers uh, because they can come at different time and still be served uh, by the exchange. Uh, and the regulatory requirements for that currently are a little bit unspecified, right? So it means it's a little bit simpler. Um, so people who are doing this currently don't kind of comply with the regulations because the regulations don't know what to do with this type of setup. Um, it is kind of problematic for the uh, law enforcement and for some of the financial uh, fraud and uh, financing terrorism. Uh, because people can exchange money, but at the same time, you have to ask yourself, you know, okay, I mean, nobody really kind of, um, uh, it, it's basically kind of like a Forex, right? Somebody exchanges one currency to another, right? So it's not even buying anything or selling anything. It's just kind of a, somebody has that value and now that value changes shape. Okay, how, how dangerous is that? 
right? It's kind of limited, right? I mean, if, if somebody uses it to launder money, yes, you can use that for money laundering purposes because you can kind of uh, change shape of your assets into something else and then try to use some privacy preserving technology. But you cannot really use this for a lot of illegal activities, right? Apart from this changing the shape. All right, so um, we just invented DEX, which is decentralized exchange, right? So it's open for everybody. Uh, it's permissionless, which means there is no account, no identification. You don't need to have you know, your certificates of any sort. Uh, you uh, don't need to deposit any of your funds anywhere. You can kind of just say, I want to exchange this for this and it happens, right? Um, and it's kind of not regulated at the moment. Yeah, so how does it work? So usually it works in a, because the, the DEXs are kind of designed to work with uh, not NOOP and USD, but they are designed to work with crypto. So what happens is you have some sort of liquidity pool let's say maybe between Ether and DAI, right? So then uh, when you put the funds in, you basically have a smart contract which locks the, your funds into some sort of pool, right? So you lock the, like uh, for the liquidity pool, you lock your funds in the, in the smart contract. And then a person who wants to buy DAI and they have, uh, they have it's Ether, so they kind of call the smart contract sending ether and the address of where they want to get the die and the smart contract sends them back the die into that address right so you don't need to deposit the funds to be able to exchange them you just say right now i just want to exchange this for that and it just happens in a single transaction right yeah um so the prerequisite is basically what I just said. You need a platform to execute the automated rules to execute the smart contract, right? And a platform to allow the, the, the funds to flow uh, and the mechanism to provide liquidity. So the mechanism to provide liquidity is the one that we discussed and the platform that we need is basically Ethereum, right? So Ethereum and smart contracts and ERC20 tokens kind of provide all the necessary building blocks for this to exist. Is Ethereum the only one? No, it's not. There are other uh, concepts and other uh, mechanisms which can fulfill the same thing, but that's the, the first one and that's the most common at the moment. Uh, you can basically do similar things with Cardano and you can do similar things with other blockchains uh, which allow you to have smart contracts and some form of token representation. Um, and they all have a kind of a built-in currency, right? So. Ethereum is not the only one, but it's definitely the most popular and the, the biggest. Um, so we have a couple of um, uh, examples, uh, Uniswap, Balancer, and Curve. Again, if you go to, um, for example, to Uniswap, um, uniswap.io, I think. So where is the, maybe .net. I want the market. Oh, that, that was a long enough. Yeah, so um, launch the app. So you, you basically have kind of uh, an ability to exchange Ether or another token. Uh, so you, you pick which token you want to exchange, like, you know, let's say we want DAI and then you select to what? So DAI to Ether, and then you connect your wallet and then you issue a transaction and then the exchange happens. So you don't need to register, you don't need to have an account, you don't need to deposit anything anywhere. You just kind of like call a transaction set the price slippage, uh, you know, buffer, and then the swap just happens. So it's kind of an atomic swap of one asset into another. Uh, and then if you want, you can go to pools and you can, uh, you can uh, view 
you can view the top liquidity pools and you can decide to become an investor and actually fuel the, 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 the pool yourself. So for example, we have, um, let's pick that one. So this one is a USDC stable coin to Ether uh, with 0.3% provision. So for every trade, all the people who contributed liquidity to that pool get 0.3% in income, right, interest. So you're gonna earn interest if you deposit your own funds into that uh, liquidity pool. And then you can basically, again, connect your wallet, click add liquidity, uh, and you say, okay, what, how, how, much, uh, how much liquidity you want to add uh, on, on one side. So let's say you have uh, $100. So it, it tells you, okay, you need to deposit 100 USDC and 0 0.24 uh, weighted Ether into the, uh, the contract. And then you will basically deposit that amount of liquidity into the pool and start earning income uh, on the 0.3% tier, right? Um, for each trade that happens in that pool. Here, what you can declare is you, you can limit how much uh, when your liquidity is offered. So in which price bracket your liquidity is offered, right? Uh, for the price of exchange between USDC and, and, and Ether. Uh, and here you can uh, limit the price slippage on, on, both, on both of those sides of when you're depositing the, the funds. And then you can connect the wallet and put the funds in. So they are making things really simple. Uh, for people to swap assets and for people to provide liquidity. Uh, and also you have some kind of a new proposals and kind of a governance model that is represented by this REP token, which I have on some other slide. Uh, REP is like a maker token for Uniswap. Uh, and then you can vote on proposals or participate in some of the more governance uh, decisions. All right, so we're going over time. Um, you can check the other ones. They all differ slightly. So for example, Uniswap is the traditional one which usually have a pools of two assets, so a pair. A balancer, on the other hand, allows uh, more than two assets to be in the pool. So it allows kind of a liquidity, like for example, three ways. So you can have uh, one stable asset and two unstable assets. Um, and the curve is even more complicated because it allows uh, a little bit more um, uh, innovation in terms of the uh, swapping. Uh, th this one is uh, also quite interesting. There, there is one more, which is called synthetics. Uh, synthetics with X. Uh, and that one is kind of like a stock exchange because you can issue uh, new tokens, which are not the real tokens backed by the a pool, but they are backed by something else. And you have kind of like a price difference of the original token. So for example, I can say, I can issue a synthetic BTC, which is backed by ether, right? So I don't issue new, new BTC. And I, uh, so this I, ERC20 token, which I call BTC, is kind of packed to Bitcoin, but not to real Bitcoin, but through a kind of intermediary asset like Ether, for example. Uh, so you can create new um, synthetic assets and they create synthetic assets, for example, for Apple stock, for Tesla stock, for gold and, and so on, right? Which are backed by other crypto, uh, crypto assets. All right, so this is uh, all nice and uh, interesting. And we have two, um two more concepts to discuss which is the liquidity pool which we already did uh we use the the price discovery uh, uh yeah so i don't want to continue because we have we went over time so i i may finish that like i have two or three slides left um and then there is a staking and um and uh, governance pools. So I will talk a little bit about it ne next week. All right, so that's, that's all for today.